ಇತಿಪಿಸೋ ಬದೇವಾ ಅರೇಹ ಸಂಬುಧೋ ವಿಧ್ಯಾಚರಣ ಸಂಪನ್ನೋ ಸುಗತೋಕವಿದು ಅನುತ್ತರು ಪುರಿಷದಮಸಾರತಿ ಸತ್ತೇವ ಮನೋಸ್ಥಾನ Namaste. So, in yesterday's video, we discussed awareness of the breath. Now, this is the foundation of all the further meditation techniques given by the Buddha. But it's not only the foundation, it's also the culmination. In other words, For, for me, for example, I've been meditating since I was in my teens. I'm 74 now, so what does that be? 50, 60 years or something? And I find myself coming back to this simple meditation on the breath, abiding in it. Uh, not just doing it as a formal meditation, but as a lifestyle. whether I'm in sitting posture or I'm moving around doing stuff, routine work or whatever, I'm always aware of my breath. And I find it has several really wonderful effects that the heart becomes open. You become much more aware of your feelings. If you notice, if you watch the breath, When you're absorbed in something external, the breath almost stops. And we also stop being aware of our feelings. This is why a lot of people use workaholism as an escape. They haven't handled their inner contradictions, so they just throw their attention into their work or other external activities, sports, and sex, and, you know, nonsense stuff. Instead of sitting down, turning the attention within, and going deep into their hearts and minds, and actually resolving their contradictions. So, I have to say that there, there's even more to it than that. There's a certain kind of bliss the Buddha calls rapture. Rapture is a wonderful thing. Let me read a short sutta. Monks, when anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, is developed and cultivated, it's very fruitful and beneficial. And how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated to be very fruitful and beneficial? It's when a monk develops mindfulness of breathing together with the awakening factors, mindfulness, investigation of principles, energy, rapture, tranquility, immersion, and equanimity, which rely on seclusion, fading away and cessation, and ripen as letting go. Mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated in this way, is very fruitful and beneficial. Now this is from the Bhojanga Sutta. Huh? Mr. Bhojanga. <laughs> and uh, There's a definite connection between this because the Buddha's teachings were extensively spread all over Africa and uh, they came to be a part of the slave patois, as it's called, the way that the African slaves spoke in America and consequently it passed into American folklore in various distorted ways and, and all that. But anyway, uh, for example, voodoo, is a distortion of Budu, which is the Buddha's name in African language. So anyway, I don't want to go into that 
uh, that's, I digress. <laughs> I want to stay with this concept of rapture. First of all, who is the Buddha talking to? He addresses them, monks. Who is a monk? A monk is someone who has let go of all gross physical desires and activities, has let go of all mundane names and forms, and the identification with the body, the identification with names, titles, and so on. All these designations, huh? positions, and you know, aristocracy, and uh, hierarchies of various kinds. So a monk is just a simple sadhu. His whole life is nothing but sadhana, meditation, rituals for auspiciousness, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, devotion. So Buddha is not talking to ordinary people engaged in the activities of conditioned life and consciousness. He's talking to people who are beyond that and who are full-time sadhus. So when he talks about abiding, for example, Abiding has a specific meaning in the Buddhist teaching. The monks, every day, after going for alms and taking their morning meal, they would go for morning abiding. Or maybe they would have classes and stuff like that. But after lunch, lunch is a big deal in Buddhist society because it's the last meal of the day. So they take a big lunch and then they go for what's called pleasant abiding. So the whole afternoon they're in pleasant abiding. Then there's usually some kind of worship or ceremonies in the evening. And then again, they go into evening abiding. So what is this abiding? Well, it's all the different meditation practices built on meditation on the breath, mindfulness of breath, non-thinking non-conceptual beingness. Now, this, these big words <laughs> sound very impressive, but it's important to understand that for a person who is engaged in the rat race of material life, of family life, business life, this is not possible. It's not possible for them to abide in these high exalted states. Somebody commented the other day, can I reach enlightenment by practicing awareness of breath for one hour a day? <laughs> or they, you know, they asked, how long would it take to reach enlightenment by one hour a day? I said, never. You'll never reach it. And I gave the example of a tree. If you have a big tree, you cut down a big tree, and then you want to burn all the wood. You can't just light a couple of small sticks, you know, and then walk away and expect the whole thing to burn. It's not going to happen because the fire cannot digest so much fuel. And in the same way, you can't just practice one hour a day and expect to reach enlightenment ever <laughs> because the mind is like a tree that has been growing for millions of births. How will you burn up the whole mind with just one hour a day? It's not possible. The Buddha talks about abiding. He talks about immersion. Huh? What were the, the words in this sutta? Mindfulness, investigation of principles. Now this investigation, is the word is vichara. And the precise word is Bodhanga Vichara. Bodhanga, as we, as we already said, means seven enlightenment factors. So these have to be investigated. They have to be understood so deeply that one's very being becomes based on these principles of enlightenment. And what are they? Mindfulness, 
investigation of principles, energy, rapture, tranquility, immersion, and equanimity. But what is this rapture? Where does this come from? Well, when one is mindful of breathing, what's really going on? Huh? How do we analyze it under the hood? Well, what's going on is that one is transferring one's identification from the gross physical body, the anamaya kosha, to the energy body, the pranamaya kosha. So this subtle energy body, I, I visualize it spontaneously when I'm, I'm mindful of breathing. And it's like, it's like Kundalini as a snake is dancing, huh? very, uh, very fast. She's very quick. It's almost like, you know, if you take an electric fan and you take a ribbon and tie a ribbon onto the housing of the fan and then turn it on and the ribbon is going to go, you know, it's going to dance around like that. Well, it's just like that. This very fast snake-like motion, which of course is the formation of the vortex of the body by the Kundalini. So this means that the identification is moving from the gross body to the subtle body. From the, the food body, huh? the bag of meat and bones, <laughs> to the energy body, which is composed of five kinds of prana. I'm not going to go into the details here, but just know that this energy body is light. It can fly. It's not subject to material contamination or conditioning or limitations. It's automatically blissful. In fact, if the Buddha's description of it as rapture really nails it. Huh? Rapture means a feeling of bliss that's just overwhelming, something that's so beautiful, you can't take your mind off it. And that's the way it feels to be immersed, huh? not just practicing as if it's something out there, but immersed completely in this mindfulness of breathing. So this will come up again in the sutta, huh? in the Mahasatipatthana sutta. It's going to come up again and again because this mindfulness of breathing is really the basis of all the other meditative techniques. And it also means that thoughts stop, or at least verbal thoughts stop. There's no more inner conversation. I mean, who is talking to whom? <laughs> You already know whatever it is you're talking about. So what's the need to talk about it to yourself? Maybe it's some kind of rehearsal for explaining yourself to somebody else. I don't know. In any case, it's worthwhile to get rid of this because it takes up so much energy and brain cells. And heaven knows we have too few brain cells as it is, <laughs> especially after the, going through the 1960s. <laughs> so better to just shut that off, just drop it, let it go. And as the Buddha says here, when developed and cultivated in this way, it's very fruitful and beneficial. Mindfulness of breathing relies on seclusion fading away and cessation and ripen as letting go. So in other words, when you do all these different techniques, when they ripen, when you get the fruit, when you get the result, it manifests as letting go. Letting go means I'm not this body, I'm not this mind, I'm not any of the things or ideas connected with the body or the mind. I'm not my attention. I'm not my desires. I'm not my consciousness. I'm not any of these things. 
Because we say my consciousness, that means it's something different from myself. So the, the goal here is to realize the self. Whether we do it by the negative path or the positive path, the, the Buddhist teaching or the Vedic teaching, it's still the same objective. And when we do this, that is the point where we reach the summum bonum, the greatest good, which is complete enlightenment. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung.